thank you for joining us for Heritage Mississauga's placemaking webinar series. This is the first of four series, four uh, webinars taking place every Wednesday in September, and we would like to open with a traditional lands uh, statement. Um, we would like to begin by acknowledging the land on which we gather today as part of the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. We acknowledge the importance of this land and pay our respects to the Anishinaabe and other First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, past, present, and future. For our webinar series, we have a, uh, well, a delightful treat, uh, if you will, to open our series with. And this, uh, our, our speaker today is Michael Spaziani with Birth of a City, putting the there in, there in Mississauga. Mississauga is a young city, growing through growing pains as always. 45 years ago, it was little more than a collection of historic villages connected by agricultural fields, concession roads, and sprawling single detached homes a bedroom community with little urban life or character. Today, it has emerged as a successful city financially, but it's not yet known as a, for its sense of place, its soul. Michael's presentation will trace the, the growth of the city and focus on placemaking and city building as the way to make the city memorable as a complete community with a focus on livability, walkability, and beautiful, memorable places. Michael is the principal of MSAI architect, uh, architectural firm specializing in urban design and architecture. Founded in 1986, the firm is celebrating its 36th year of practice, headquartered in a restored heritage building, beautiful restored heritage building, the Nash House in Port Credit. Uh, Michael Spaziani is a, a, a commenced his architectural career winning the Royal Architectural Institute of Canada's Medal for Academic Excellence upon graduation from Carleton University in 1977. In 2010, Michael was inducted into the Royal Architectural Institute for Ca of Canada College of Fellows, an honor reserved for only a few Canadian architects each year. He has been the recipient of many urban design awards in Ontario for building projects through in Oakville, Kitchener, Mississauga, Pickering, and Brampton and beyond. And he's advised on municipal councils on Markham, Mississauga, Toronto, Guelph, and many other locations. Um, and uh, I could go on and on. Michael, really one of my favorite people that I've ever had the opportunity to engage with and work with, both as a member of, of uh, the Mississauga Heritage Advisory Committee for many years, um, and just a passionate advocate for not only heritage, but for the communities uh, that are that make up our, our city here at home, and the idea of not only the value of our past, but uh, kind, of, kind of shaping that roadmap for the future. I recall, Michael, a, a, a walking tour you gave uh, several years ago now, pre-COVID, for Jane's Walk in Cooksville, and not only talking about the history of the place, but the, the possibilities of, of what could be and what, what might be coming, and that desire to push the envelope in terms of, um, I, I guess, challenging builders to build excellence, um, to build future heritage. Uh, and so that concept of future heritage and uh, past meets, meets future uh, is, is, is a fascinating one and one I've always delighted in speaking with you with. So with that, uh, we'll open our, our uh, placemaking webinar series with uh, our first webinar with uh, Michael Spaziani. Thank you, Michael, so much for, for once again taking part with, uh, with our programming here. Well, thank you for the great introduction. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, I can start my video, I think, soon. I want to thank you for uh, inviting me to this. Um, so the theme of birth of a city, I mean, that's, this is something that's preoccupied my, uh, my interest since I, I moved to Mississauga some 33 years ago, moved my practice out of Toronto. But I was intrigued by Mississauga. It was a place that was evolving. Um, and it, it had a past that was really quite interesting and a future that you know, in a sense, was the future of any new city. It's the lessons of the new city were, were learned here. And the concept of putting the there there, I'll explain. Um, there, Gertrude Stein back in 1935, I'll just spend a minute and explain a little bit about this, this theme. Um, she lived in Paris from about 1900 to 1935. And then well, then she went back to Oakland, her birthplace. And when she was there, and she, you know, she's a famous novelist um, in history, but she quipped that um, there was no there there. In other words, she went back to the place where she was born and she found out that it had changed in an undesirable way. 
It was dreary, it was uninspiring. And you can see this is a picture from 1935, Oakland, California. And you can see that the car had really become a dominant uh, force in the, uh, in, in, the, in the way a city functioned. So she, that's, where, that's what inspired this kind of topic, is like, how do we put the there into a city um, to make it memorable, to make it pleasurable, to make it a, a living place, a, a very vital place. And that's where Mississauga, I believe, is heading. And it's been a bit of a, a bumpy road to get there. And I want to trace the history of that road just to, uh, just to give you a sense of where we were and where we're going. Um, you know, this slide shows you on the bottom left is a kind of a rural presence, the land that existed before, and just the beginnings of some roads. And the top right of that image shows how Mississauga evolved into a grid of streets, into shopping centers, into uh, subdivisions. And, um, and today it's emerged as a very successful uh, city financially, but not yet known for its sense of place or its soul. I think this is something we're witnessing on a daily basis with every new endeavor that we see. I think one of the high, high, high points is to see Celebration Square and the way it's being used for festivals. So we're seeing the city beginning to emerge um, from what was a fairly monolithic or, or very simple past that was mostly dormitory housing. Before that, it was very much an indigenous natural landscape. But as we moved ahead, um, we see a city emerging. So. <laughs> what, was, what was Mississauga like in uh, 300 AD, you may wonder? Well, I can tell you what the Romans were doing. And, and this to me is an interesting part as an urban designer. The Romans wanted to make every city they conquered uh, familiar. And to do that, they came up with an idea of a north-south street, a cardo, it's called. And you can just barely see it here. My cursor is moving up and down. It's a north-south street. So every city that, the, that the, the Romans conquered would set up the, this uh, grid of streets, this intersection of streets, the Decumanus and the Cardo. And at the intersection was the Forum, the heart of the city. I call it the square one of the city. There's a little bit of an intended reference there. So the Forums at square one, the places of entertainment, the Colosseum, the temples were all kind of aligned in particular places with respect to that. And, it, and back in 300 AD, of course, uh, the indigenous uh, were the inhabitants, inhabitants of, of uh, what is today Mississauga. Um, so none of this thinking, this uh, kind of urban design thinking was going on other than really thinking about, um, well, the use of the Credit River, it was very central to their, to their life and their living. And so it's always played a very fundamental role that has carried on from past histories to current histories. And you're gonna hear more about how the Credit River Valley has become a, uh, one of those great memorable events within Port Credit that I think has a future that we can begin to build upon and to uh, even emphasize more. So we're flipping ahead to 1960, and this is the corner of here, Ontario and Burnham Thorpe, here, Ontario being the Pardo, Burnham Thorpe being the Decumanus in the Roman sense. So. But in 1960, we had these concession roads that were, began to be overlaid on the natural you know, farm fields of, of Mississauga. And this is looking to the Northwest. So you know, in 1960, there really wasn't a Mississauga. There was just a series of villages uh, that, that were sprinkled around the, the region, more supporting the agricultural purpose uh, functions. And, the, and, and we'll talk more about that as we go through. Um, this is moving to 1975. So you can see between 1960 and 75, square one uh, gets realized. This is a dream of Bruce McLaughlin. He, he, he relayed this story to me and he said he was flying over, uh, flying over Toronto or out of Toronto and just looking at, you know, 50,000 feet down on the, the landscape. And he saw, he had a vision of what Mississauga could be. And he was the development arm behind square one. And it started really what was the kind of the retail presence, the retail mall presence uh, that was all supported by surface parking. So again, not long, we've got the car in play, we've got retail in play, 
And we jump to 2020 and we can see the further development of new towers, the absolute Maryland, the Maryland Monroe towers and various other towers around city center. But square one has persisted and has grown as it expanded. So we're keeping an eye on this one and seeing where it can go and trying to guide it in a way that will make it uh, a memorable place to live. And, and one of the bright spots, as I said, Celebration Square is beginning to emerge as one of those bright spots that's, uh, that's emerging in the city center. So the question then is what makes a city memorable? Um, you know, these sorts of memorable places, and the image I'm showing you there is simply, it's a, it's a street in Paris. And ironically, it was a street that was formerly a Roman road. So I thought there was a nice tie in to what we're talking about. But to Paris today, I think when we travel, we, we, we see these places and we, we feel, why can't we do this in our own hometown where you have a mix of cafes, a mix of fresh fruit and vegetables, the variety of shops, people walking. Uh, there's, there's a whole lifestyle that's attached to this that I think creates a sense of memorable place um, in the sense of new builds and new buildings. This is something that I, I constantly remind myself about we need to create places that are that have these qualities, the mix of uses, the walkability. Um, Europe's a great example of uh, the ritual of walking. In Italy, they call it the passeggetta, which is, you know, after dinner, you'd go for an hour stroll with your family through the center of the town, through the square. In, in Paris, there was the flaneur, the, the walker that, you know, had nothing better to do than to just walk and think about things walking through the city. But this is, this is the power of walking and the power of place that makes it memorable in my mind. So we're, we're gonna ex examine where are those places in Mississauga? You know, there's, they are emerging. And the good news is I think they're emerging more rapidly now. You're gonna hear more about all of that through the webinar series. Um, in future talk speakers will be more specific about some of the, uh, the current developments. And, um, you know, where is it emerging? And essentially, the new city developments is a place of focus where we're going to see these sorts of things. So Mississauga has gone through its various periods of development. Um, the pre-colonial times, the indigenous period, I think, is one of the fundamental ones. And what, what was memorable for the indigenous in this, um, in this time? Um, well, the, I would say the river, the Credit River and its banks, it provided transportation, it provided food, it provided a place to trade when, when colonials did arrive. It was a place for the nomadic tribes to camp and to settle in some later, later cases. And it was a place for burial grounds as we've recently found. There's been some post excavations along the Credit River where, where bones as old as 10,000 years have been discovered. And, and that's a testament to the, to the history that underlies uh, Mississauga and our past. Um, so again, from an indigenous perspective, this was an extremely memorable and extremely important place by virtue of all of these aspects that the river and nature provided in its day. And we move on to what I call the colonial settlement period. Um, this is essentially the application of surveys the creation of lots, the, uh, you can see a grid of streets. The very first surveys were laid down in, um, um, in concession roads. Um, these, were, these are the way our, almost every city in, in Ontario is laid out by virtue of engineering uh, data. But this one reveals a little other thing. It shows the Credit River and it shows lands a mile on either side of the Credit River. And that's what formed uh, that was the uh, Treaty 23 uh, reserve, uh, reserve creation. Um, this was set aside for, for, the, uh, for the indigenous and the rest was available for settlers, the new colonial settlers. So in this period, um, the Credit River Valley now takes on a, 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 a use of uh, industrial purpose. The mills were starting to come in. Streetsville has its... Uh, the, you know, the, the, the flour mills, of, and we see sawmills, we see that the river created this industrial uh, presence. It provided transportation, it provided food, it provided trade, it provided places to settle, very desirable places, by the way, and, and it created wealth. This is the new addition, the colonial 
uh, purpose shifted to one of making making a living and doing well by it. So a lot of industry sprouted up by virtue of the river the riverways the uh, that that flowed through these lands. And then the colonial settlement period. What were those? What were the memorable places during that time? Because the settlement took the form of villages. You know, you're familiar with Streetsville, Port Credit, Meadowvale, and Cooksville. Um, and just to focus on Cooksville for a minute, you, you remember the crossroads of Cooksville was populated by these two very famous buildings. Some I even remember seeing the, the Cooksville in here. Um, and this was the, uh, the building on the other side that uh, was, was one of the landmarks. That, and that was maybe the memorable place. The intersections became the memorable places of these settlement places. They were a bit like the Roman crossroads. They were the place where you got gas. They were the place where you met people. Um, in Streetsville, we had a, a different set of things. We had the Mechanics Institute, Farmer's Reference Library, very helpful for the agricultural purpose and the mill, mill purposes. Uh, the river, the mills, the agricultural center, community services, they lined up along, along Queen Street. Commerce boomed along that. It was a service center for the, for the area. But it had a soul and a life of its own and a kind of memory that we don't want to lose. This, these, are, these are also important components of a uh, placemaking endeavor in Mississauga. Now, Port Credit, again, we have the lake, we have the river coming together. We have stone hookers in history. We have trading place with the indigenous. We had rum running and we had the smell of cornstarch. <laughs> All memorable histories of Port Credit. Um, and ones we don't want to forget. So, I mean, it's even even things like, uh, even like rum running, when you see Stonehooker, a new craft brewery that's opened up that, that, that celebrates that history. Um, it's, it's a great example of how history can have a purpose in present days and also have, have one going into the future. Meadowvale Village, another example, uh, the town hall, the Gooderm Estate Mansion and its landscape, its heritage character throughout. These are memorable places that we have today uh, based on this period, uh, the colonial uh, period. Then there was the kind of the sprawl period of Mississauga, and some would call this the dark period <laughs> because, you know, Mississauga was known as a bedroom suburb, a dormitory to Toronto. Um, the private backyard became the memorable place. People sought out Mississauga so they could have their, their small little castle with private yard and a beautiful place. So there was a bit of a celebration of privacy over the collective benefit of, of, of placemaking. Placemaking is about community coming together. The suburb, the sprawl, the individual detached house is one that was more about cherishing privacy. So it was this, this kind of dichotomy between um, wanting what was important to the individual, the house. And so sprawl was simply responding to what people wanted. They wanted this, they wanted to get out of cities, dense cities, and they wanted it in Mississauga. So it's an escape from the city. A car was the king, you had to have a car if you chose this lifestyle, but that was also considered very desirable. I wanted a car, I wanted a fast car, I wanted a hot car, I wanted, <laughs> I wanted a car. Uh, all of this, you know, the layouts of these cities, there's no gridded streets, you know, there were, there were difficulties if you were walking to get to this corner or to go to a corner, you had to find your way through a kind of maze of streets because nothing was simple in a gridded way, the way that cities are. Toronto, for example, is a grid of streets, but Mississauga introduced this idea, we call it the dead worm, disrespectfully, and the cul-de-sac, which is celebrates privacy. That's the most private spot in the in the subdivision is the cul-de-sac because only a few houses share it. You don't have to mix with the riffraff. It's almost like a gated community. I, not a high point of Mississauga's history, but one that's real and one that's still cherished. So as we move forward, you can't give it up. And then I, what I'm calling the square one period is the ri rise of retail. Once once residential kind of gets established in the community, you find that retail follows. It's just a, it's a historic kind of relationship. The market shows up, the market responds with retail services. Um, so Mississauga became, or the square one became the very memorable place of this period. 
it was the you know very exciting mall, new mall. In a, in a, but but in a way, it was a mall not unlike other malls. Toronto had its Fairview Mall. Um, it, it had Yorkville Yorkville Mall. These are these are malls that you could almost say are independent of place. They exist anywhere. They have national brands generally. So it's not exactly what I would call the kind of placemaking that I think we want to do today. We want placemaking that is very much part of the soul of the community, uh, unique to the community. And it's always troubling to find that unique thing. Every city thinks it wants to have find its unique place, but there are things that are constant and overlapping, but Every city, I believe, does have a memorable component to it. And, and that's what we want to talk about as we move forward. Um, and then there was an, an emerging urban condition in the city center, the growth of the head office. Mississauga attracted some very powerful main head offices that, again, escaped from Toronto or from other centers. And that was by proxy to an airport. There's a very variety of reasons, but um, it, um, it, created a boom and gave city center a, a, an employment purpose that's been hard to keep going. I think we're going to see more of a condo boom as we go forward. But it went through various periods. And I, I've done talks on this where, you know, at one point buildings in the 70s all seemed to have a 45 degree angular shape on the plan. That seemed to be a some sort of memorable idea that, that someone came up with. That quickly passed. It was like a fashion thing from the period. And then I call what's called the disco period. We, we started to see apartment buildings that were kind of uh, finished in uh, reflective pink mirrors, sort of like a disco ball. I, I, I call this the disco period. But um, again, another fashion statement, it kind of came and went as a fashion trend. It didn't really celebrate street edge as much as, um, as a, occupying you know, a very functional space. If you're old enough to remember, the Sussex Center did have it had some nice entertainment places in it. So it was a place to go. I know when our kids were young, we would, we would go there to enjoy some of the restaurants. So it did have a memorable purpose, albeit interior. And where it could have shone, I don't know if you recall, there's a parking, a little parking area along Burnham Thorpe along this edge, which um, is not what you call a, a, a street friendly presence. In a, in, a, in a kind of urban design sense. So again, I, I think of these as periods and, and areas where mistakes were made and things carried on. So we, we, we inherit these, they're there today, they're not going away, um, and they're part of our history. And then there's the period of the, the, the postmodern period of City Hall and, and, you, and what this introduced as a memorable place certainly was its look, it was controversial in its day, but, um, and perhaps still is, but what we do gain from this is a remarkable celebration square. And this to me is our first major step towards community placemaking. One that creates events, festivals, casual meetings, films, sporting events. There's a variety of things that make this memorable. So it's a good, it's a good pattern to consider when we think about uh, placemaking in the city. Um, then we saw after the kind of office booming, office boom and the retail boom, we, we got into the condo boom. And that's what you see today. I mean, you see all of these buildings, they came in at different periods through different styles, very contemporary styles are emerging today. Of course, the Maryland buildings, you know, um, and the M2, M city buildings, again, very dramatic, um, almost all competing with each other to have more spotlight. They're all, Kind of they're far from the square. I remember when Hazel McCallion said, you know, I can design a box. <laughs> give me some, give me some interesting architecture. Well, I think we're getting it in spades and maybe almost to excess when every building strives to be different from one another, that begins to become a, a to me a problem as well. So unity, uh, contemporary design are important ideas. But most important to tie all this together, despite possibly even mistakes in history, we want to make placemaking a kind of a new focus. And, and to do that, Mississauga went through its strategic plan review almost 10 years ago now. And I had a hand in that. I, I had the pleasure of being part of the team to take this challenge to the people of Mississauga through a, through a planning team working with the city. Um, what, you know, what was... Uh, 
essentially what was the, if you read this little quote, I'll just read it, it's a little hard to read. It's about placemaking and it's one of our, our strategic goals. The city is striving to create a sense of place, a strong positive identity for each area and the city as a whole. Neighborhoods need their own personality, a heart, great places, unique, welcoming, livable, beautiful, contribute to an improved quality of life, engage the public realm, and reinforce a sense of community. This is what underlies all of our plans in this society. When we create a new building, we have to pay attention to these goals. And we have to answer the question, do we, have, we sat, have we created this? And this becomes the test for moving forward, getting a successful place to live with beautiful places that are memorable. Um, this is, the, this is the, the, the master plan for that. Strategic plan sets the goals. It has its five pillars focused on quality of life. Um, and there are focal sites where new development is now being welcomed. You're gonna hear about the waterfront, city center, and the corridors. They're becoming the, the key focal sites for new intensified development. A lot of which is related to move, the concept of transit, and but also walking and cycling. These are all part of the move component. So we have to we have to evaluate every development within these parameters that have been set out in our strategic plan. And then um, we have a placemaking era uh, in the city center. And uh, this is something. This starts to introduce. Uh, some of the positives that we've seen through, through a program of unlimited height. You, you know that city center, you can build a building of any height as long as you provide the enough parking, enough, uh, enough energy, enough sewage treatment potential, you can build a, a 500 story building if you want. Um, the Maryland building is an example and it's you know, in the six, some 60 odd stories, it was built under that, uh, under that goal. So it's, it's a, it, it attracted you know, very extreme development as a strategy that saw the build out of the city happen rather quickly. It was a, a mechanism to prompt development. Um, what we see in city center, I've mentioned, you know, Celebration Square as a tremendous success for placemaking. Um, and the, the role of public art has begun to emerge. I've just included this slide at the corner, you know, in front of the Marilyn Monroe building showing how public art now has an important role in defining placemaking and making it memorable. So that when you experience the corner of these buildings, um, you, first of all, you know exactly where you are in the city. You're, you're at the center of the city. You're at the, the, inter the Roman intersection, if you will, the square one. Um, so these are important parts of making placemaking memorable. And then placemaking era within the villages, there's a whole other kind of scale of placemaking that's occurring within the villages. Um, and we've begun to embrace placemaking. Um, you may have, you've been to the corner of, of uh, Lake, Lake Shore and, um, and here Ontario, you'll see this beautiful sculpture of uh, the ribbon dress and the uh, an indigenous uh, history that's, that's portrayed here. It's a wonderful testament to tying a history story to an important crossroads in the village. So bringing the stories out from the past, bringing them to a place that you experience on a daily basis, that's probably one of the strongest themes that I think we could ever apply to the city to make it memorable, to never forget our stories and our past. Even when I look at this mural that's uh, by, the, by the lighthouse, you know, it tells the story of the lighthouse keeper who had to row his boat out to the remote location of the original lighthouse. These are stories told through public art that make walking through the passages under the, under the Lakeshore Road, under the bridge, you become exposed to this and it tells the story. So again, a really important component of uh, placemaking is telling the story of our history. The other thing we're seeing in the villages is the animated streetscape. You know, the presence in Port Credit and elsewhere now, the presence of the patio, the terrace extension. And this is to bring vibrancy. And if you've been to Port Credit on the weekend, you know where vibrancy sometimes might get out of hand. But it does create a sense of uh, place. And I think controlled with the right aesthetics and the right, uh, right types of controls, it makes it a very memorable and uh, in, in great space to live. 
The other component that we see, and, and I'm focused here just on port credit to a degree, but um, this is the square at uh, the market square at port credits, the square where uh, there are restaurants. There's a restaurant with patio seating outside. There's a coffee offer with seating outside. This is well used throughout the year. And then there are programming of these spaces, same as in Celebration Square. The programming of these spaces is an important component of bringing out people to enjoy it, to experience the city, to be outside. The importance of these outside places, I think, is, is important to stress. As we build more apartment farms, people are living in smaller and smaller accommodations with less and less kind of outdoor presence, no yards, small balconies. These kinds of places become extremely important in making, uh, making a community livable. So uh, this is a, a very strong focus of placemaking to compensate for um, the intensification that is coming by virtue of all of the transit uh, improvements that are, that are coming our way. We're going to see tall buildings and tense buildings. And here's an example on the waterfront. This is Lakeview, the master plan of Lakeview. And from a placemaking perspective, this was built around placemaking. And if you, you'll see, I'm gonna show you some of the images, you may have seen some, but the primary move was this very broad greenway that came from Lakeshore all the way down to a very green and public waterfront. This is an important placemaking idea that was overlaid on this site from day one um, as a really critical way of, of, of integrating the site with the waterfront trail to the, to the west um, and continuing the waterfront trail to the east. And you know we can credit Jim Tovey with some of these thoughts about this filling in this conservation area with Lakefield and extending our waterfront. So all of a sudden you've now got continuity of the waterfront trail along the waterfront and continuing to the, to the east into Toronto. So again, built around concepts of placement. And you can see there's, there are, and I'll show you a few other uh, images from here. There are places like this that are urban squares down by the water. There's the old canals that were uh, remnants of the hydro uh, function of the, of the day. There's the creation, the recreation of Searson Creek, bringing it back to a natural uh, pre uh, ple pleasure or presence. Um, it was buried through culverts over the years, but part of the placemaking initiative here was to remind people that this was a natural creek, and it was again going to be a natural creek. And uh, this work has been in progress already. Um, and there's the pier. This to me is really exciting. It's taking the old piers that, that were here and augmenting them, adding piers, and having places of entertainment out in the water. Um, cruise ships would start to animate this place. So we're seeing elements of placemaking being applied um, both to settlement areas and, and, and areas for festivals and, and people coming together, as well as beautiful places where rivers are restored and pathways are provided and connections are provided. So again, this is an example. You're gonna hear more about this one in future web webinars, but I wanted to touch on it just as an example of how new development can seize um, this concept of, um, of placemaking. And Brightwater is another one in Port Credit, which I think, again, you've probably seen examples of, but it, it has many of the same features, a connection from Lakeshore down to the river, uh, down to the lake. A, an angular alignment, and this may not be known to many, but it's, it's an angular, why did they go on an angular grid here as opposed to the regular grid that you see elsewhere? This was an alignment of the one, the, the one mile off the Credit River, there was an alignment on an angle that was created by virtue of the, in the, the, the reservation of the Credit Reserve uh, lands. So this is a, you know, this is a bit of a story about the history of how this angle, an odd angle came to be. And it's been built into the, into the project as a way to connect Lakeshore to the, to the lake. Um, the lake park connects everything up on along the lakeshore. So it's a reconnection of the broader uh, park presence there. And it has urban squares up where the retail will be. So it, it, it reinforces and builds on lakeshore as a vital, you know, urban edge with shops and office and, and people living. And it introduces you to, um, you know, an urban square, not unlike um, what we saw in Port Credit in, in, in Ontario. So you're gonna have another place, another place where you can program events. 
You're going to have another street that you can stroll and shop along, um, all of which is tailored to our community. Um, that, that, I think, is what's uh, really quite special. And the stories and the history are told through the, the un, through, through the re, are revealed through the creation of these public spaces. So the future and the past revealed. So there's a theme here, and this is, this is one that I, you know, I like to dwell on. Um, so when we're building new placemaking, the future placemaking, we want to tell the story, reveal the stories about the indigenous settlements that preceded us. We want to mark and celebrate those locations where things happen. You know, we know at the mouth of the Credit River, there was a, there was a trading building, you know, that the British created where they traded with the indigenous. Um, so that's an important location. There's a plaque at that location, but, you know, I think the story has to be revealed in a more tangible way. And there's now a recreation of the park space in the works. Um, and I think the challenge from, the, from us is to say, make sure you tell the story about the indigenous history. Um, in the colonial settlements, you know, we talk about the insertion of public art, the programming of places, gathering places, and relating them to historic places where things happen. Um, you know, in Streetsville, for example, they used to have horse races up and down the street and down the river valley. They, there, were, there were elements like that that really speak to the history of the place. Um, so this is a, a challenge, a placemaking challenge that we would apply to what I call the colonial settlements, in this case, the villages. Um, they're the lost settlements, you know, the Pucky Huddle, the Frogmore, Dixie, Whaley's, I don't even know where these things are, but I know Matthew does. <laughs> but I, I think that there should be a way to mark where these are um, in current development. When, when development occurs where they were, there should be a way to, to really celebrate the history and make sure people remember what these, why they were there, who were they there for, who are the four important stories and people around them. This is an important idea about placemaking going forward. And in, in emerging settlements, you, you know, you see this idea of establishing what I call public realm gems that will live well into the future. The waterfronts, the squares, the parks, the streets, the trails. That's the challenge. At the emerging settlements, that's a challenge of space. Build your settlements around these themes, add these other story elements to it, and, and you're getting successful placemaking. Now, cultural landscapes, let's not forget those as future class placemaking initiatives. We have the credit group. We have places like Britannia School site, where there was an important history uh, related to the original school site. Um, these areas are being created as public gathering places. And uh, again, uh, you know, there's recreation events. We at uh, Heritage Mississauga, you know, we put on some of the recreation of, of, of the wars uh, in some of these uh, locations. And uh, they're very well attended and they, they tell the story of the place. And again, another example of how you tell a story in a current, a current day place that uh, keeps, reminds you of how life was back in, in those days. It's part of our heritage. And the other places where the existing parks and open spaces, again, these are places where festivals, parades, strategic street closings, gatherings, film, filmings on buildings. These are things that are all potentials and are happening within our parks and within our open spaces. Um, again, ways to celebrate the community, to come together, to make placemaking meaningful for people that live here. So each of the above initiatives would be, they'd be documented as program activities, capital works on an annual basis, following a master plan of phase stages. So, so this is an important component. You need to program these things. It's not just about physical space. It's about creating budgets and capital works, uh, creating capital. So there's grant money that's involved in this. Um, and, and follow a master plan that can be implemented because these spaces need to have uh, you know, this kind of programming to go on. And that includes digital programming, using films, using projection, using wall murals, cell phone activation, guides, walking tours. These are all elements in the high tech edge that can start to tell the stories of our walking places, our place making places. So there's, uh, you know, I, I wanted to include some of these images because I've done a talk on the things not to do when you're building a city. <laughs> This is Mr. Le Corbusier in 1920, uh, planning out uh, this Ville Radieuse, this future city of the future. Um, and 
frankly, you know, it created this kind of strange city with freeway down the center of it and bridges. Um, this is something I, I'd say this is why architects should not design cities. <laughs> they can go off on tangents that are all about built form and not about open space and quality of open space. That's the big difference I want to point out. Uh, another example of what not to do, Brasilia. Brasilia is laid out on a very romantic metaphor of a bird flying the emergence of Brazil in this new capital. But the distances, if you're, and I was, when I visited this, I was walking and you, you can see the car here. These are vast distances between buildings. And, and so while there's this focal space, an organizing element, a spine, um, there was no five minute walk here, 400 meter walk. These were kilometers long from, from one end to the other. The plan was probably about five kilometers. So it, it was not an easy way to get around. And this city was planned on, on a very isolated uses. They had an entertainment district. They had a retail shopping district. They had a residential district. None of them was mixed. None of it was mixed. So again, another mistake. Mixing uses means you're proximate to other, all uses. It means the city's complete. Another really important idea about placemaking, mixing uses, access nearby. And there are some lessons from the, lab, the past, and I always love to show this slide because this is, a, this is an image from 1910 by an architect named Enar. He called it the street of the future. And I could, I could spend a lot of time on this one, but I'll try to just give you the highlights. First of all, it's a traditional street. Uh, canopies, weather protection. This is a little magazine, a little store here, and it's showing some sunlight coming in through an upper window, so that you get some little brightness in there. Until he was an architect. And on this side is a little atelier, a little place where they're making things. I don't know what they're making, maybe hats, maybe nooses, I don't know. There's some, there's some uh, product being made here and, and, and available to the street. Down the middle of the streets, look at this. It looks like here in Ontario, there's a streetcar running down the middle. <laughs> so, you know, this little city of the future predicted in 1910 is beginning to happen in lots of places in Ontario. Um, when you look at other things here, there's a flying vehicle up here landing on the roof and on an elevator, and it, it, it transfers all the way down through here to support the supply various uses within the building. There's cars parked in underground garages. This is 1910. That, the plane is, is stored in underground garages. Um, all of the services are handled on a tier below the road, so all of the moving of goods, the rail, is all happening here. Sewage is all happening down here. So this is this little image has um, so many wonderful little things that I think predict the future. It even predicts the spacing of buildings. See these angular lines? These talk about the distance that separates buildings to be equal one high to one wide. It's a 45 degree angle, which if you remember your trigonometry, it's a one to one ratio of width to height. And the purpose of that in, in, in certainly Paris and locally in our planning here in Mississauga, we try to create daylight spaces that allow sun in so they're not too close, they're not too tight. So this was a, a method to control height and to make sure that there was sun penetration. And in French here, there's a rayon lumière, radius, uh, a luminous uh, ray of sunlight, out of sunlight, I guess is the translation, into the street. And it's meant to protect for that and, and the, make the quality of the space bright, cheerful, not gloomy. So it has that component. It shows gardens where they would be to the backside of the urban bustle. So there's on the backs, you see these beautiful parks. So buildings are set up to enjoy views to nature. And, on, and if you look in on the floors, these are the residential floors. You can see a, in, in, in Europe, you know that the apartment is a very desirable Rental apartment is a very desirable place to live. They do not have the single detached houses the way we do, the same extent. People live in very luxurious buildings and enjoy a high quality of life within this format of building. And this, this even shows a lady with a, with a vacuum. It looks like a vacuum hose. I didn't think such things existed in 1910, but there's a pipe here and it goes down through and it collects in the, in the basement. 
So it appears to be there, there's a maid involved and someone cleaning the floor. So that speaks to the kind of, uh, uh, you know, the, the appeal of these places. These, these were like our highest end, uh, beautiful residences all stacked. Anyway, I always, I go back to this because it reminds me that, you know, over a hundred years ago, we had some pretty, pretty good ideas about city building that we shouldn't forget. And as it turns out, we're, we're beginning to implement some of these. And the future of transit, that's always a, you know, because the transit allows us to build these sorts of places in a more compressed way. But we know that the, the challenge with transit, the challenge with is with traffic, the use of the car. So there are mechanisms coming that are, are allowing us to consider alternatives to use of the private car. So this is only a, a, this is a direction where it's beginning to head. I mean, this is extreme. These are Uber's taxi fleet that's being, being designed and considered now. Even in Los Angeles and, and in Dallas, they are doing these prototype buildings that are stations for these Uber flying taxis. These are in prototype mode. Some are being, some are being prepared for future Olympic events. And so these are, being, these are on drafting boards being considered. So there is a shift going on in how we get around the city with an idea that the use of the private automobile, and in our case, the use of two or three private automobiles will eventually decline and they'll be, they'll be offsetting um, uh, vehicles, ways of getting around that will help us to create cities that have more of a walkable sensibility as opposed to a, a vehicle-based sensibility. So getting closer to the end of this, I think the, um, I wanted to just talk about definitions a bit because uh, Robert Studeville, um, he's, uh, he's the head of the Congress of New Urbanism and he writes about this placemaking and he defines it. He defines placemaking as the process of creating quality places that people want to live, work, play, and learn in. And they include a mix of uses, effective public place spaces, effective meaning usable, vibrant, programmed, broadband capability. Who would have thought? But having access to broadband, this Port Credit has really recently instit instituted a, a local broadband connection. So this is another way that we start to understand how to use our city and our places. Multiple transportation options, very important concept. You can get around by bike, you can get around by proper bike lanes. That's a, that's a growth direction that we have to follow and we have been working on it. It's got a ways to go. Multiple housing options. This is important, affordability, rental housing, ownership housing. These are all components of, uh, of a successful community. And I think about Streetsville and, and Mississauga and Port Credit, I should say, is having an abundance of rental type housing that, and as, as well as luxury condo, as well as luxury single homes. And this creates a, a demographic mix that I think enlivens the spirit of place in Port Credit and Streetsville. Preservation of historic structures, a really important component. Obviously one dear to myself, we have a, an office that we've restored. You've seen the restoration of, uh, of the library in uh, Streetsville, the original library. Um, and we've seen um, the post office in Port Credit. These, and we're seeing the small arms building down in, in Lakeview. These are all important historic structures that told stories about the place. So again, preservation, maintenance of those, really important component. And respecting community heritage. So the broader heritage of the community, and this goes back to the, uh, you know, the community before colonial, it goes to the indigenous periods. Um, it, it goes to the multicultural experience. This is our community. Everyone has a heritage that's tied to different origins. Celebrating all of this and respecting it is really important. Arts, culture, and creativity, another huge, oh, sorry, just backed up here. Let me just finish this and then we can go to closing slides. Uh, arts, culture, creativity. So the focus on, on creative spaces. Um, again, I mentioned small arms inspection building, uh, public art, murals. These are all vehicles for telling the history of the place and making the place more enjoyable as a result of it. Recreation. 
again, the use of our open spaces for recreation as simple as walking, but also the ball diamonds, the other things. These are all part of making a place memorable, making placemaking memorable. And of course, green space, the landscaped open space. In this sense, the Credit River Valley is one of our gems that I see as a, a memorable focal point for for new and in, new initiatives right now it's there's a domination of two and i say in one area there's two golf courses that kind of privatize the court and i in my dream world i would like to see those two i have to say this i have to see those two makes gonna make some people very angry especially ones that belong to the, the clubs i'd like to see the two courses merge into one beautiful course maybe a 27 hole course but spin off development rights that would allow the public to reoccupy the, uh, the lands and tie into the to the north um, up the river valley so extend the reach of the of the pedestrian access access to the river valley i think that would be a goal that would make mississauga credit river even more memorable in the future and then this one quiet it's become a big theme uh, i do a lot of work in yorkville noise is a huge issue noise is a huge issue in port credit where i live um, and, and, and his, he says, unless they are designed to be otherwise. I guess if you wanted a noisy place as your theme, go knock yourself out, but <laughs> not normally what we expect. Um, and I, I just want to you know, give you a, just a very quick run through of some, some memorable things that streets that define our cities. You've seen the Paris streets. If you've been to Copenhagen, you've probably experienced the, the Strobit, which is a you know, no car. Public, public zone that creates a kind of part of that city. Carnaby Street in London, similarly pedestrian oriented, occasional vehicles just for service. But these, you think of these cities and you think of these spaces and, and, and they become, oh, those are the memories. These are, these are, you know, we come back from Paris, just like uh, Gertrude Stein did. And she said, well, where'd, where'd my town go? Where did all the good stuff go? I mean, the good stuff for her was just the natural landscape but it became a car dominated landscape. Uh, Quebec City, I'm sure many have visited. You've seen it's uh, Rue de Picha Champlain, spelled wrong, I'm sorry to say, my apologies. But again, a place that's rich with pedestrian movement, uh, interesting shops, beautiful places, um, and a great history to tell. So all of these are important streets in the world. And then squares, it's another fundamental one. And you've seen these, I mean, there's Times Square, there's the Vatican, there's, I haven't seen this one, Federation Square in Melbourne, but done in a very contemporary uh, kind of direction, design direction. So I don't wanna suggest that uh, places have to be historic in their, their appearance. They have to use contemporary means and, and landscapes from today. Um, and then one of my favorites in Italy is Siena. I mean, this used to be used as a race course, a horse racing course for an annual thing. So a festival in a, in a square was the heart of the city and a memorable, a memorable part of its history. Again, very important component of it. Um, and then just to end, Robert Studeville goes on to say, places of this sort have been around for centuries, responding to innate human needs and desires. Um, so that concludes this. I, I, I want to just, on these slides, I want to say this is an example where there was no there there, so Oakland of 1935. And this is a place where there's a future for a there there. And I wanted to focus on the Credit River because I believe it's one of the areas that will inform many of the, the great places that we, uh, we develop in the future by restoring, by opening up access, by having festivals along it, by enjoying the river and telling the story of the river. Thank you. Um, with that, uh, Michael, thank you. Uh, we've had some glowing tributes here. Just uh, uh, people just wanting to say thank you and uh, great presentation, good content, pacing, interesting. It's always nice when you receive a passing grade. So, <laughs> and it's instant, man. I don't have to wait. There, there you go. <laughs> Well, it's uh, a pleasure for me. Thank you for that. Yeah, and and like, like we said, I, I you know we could, we could probably go on for hours and still only scratch the surface. And um, uh, I mean, there's so many. We've had a question here about uh, further discussions of multimodal and active transportation within the city. And yes, yes. Uh, I, I know you touched on a, a lot of subjects that could be you know entire presentations under themselves, like cultural landscapes and and, and the like. So. Uh, oh, wow. 
not not to mention the the, the creation of public realm gems you know like the, the, the that opportunity of future heritage i think is is a brilliant uh, um, and fascinating topic to to look at so um but i think we have to i think uh, i think we have to stop somewhere so this is a, a good place to stop on the thanks and uh, um i really appreciate your time uh, everyone who has uh, tuned in thank you for joining us here for uh, heritage mississauga's placemaking webinar series on the first session join us next week as we welcome frank giannoni uh and we'll continue this uh, exploration of uh, of of place and this and place making in the city of Mississauga. So with that, Michael, thank you so very much and uh, always appreciate your time and your, uh, your, your expertise. My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for joining us today for our 2022 placemaking webinar series. We would like to thank Michael Spaziani for joining us today to share his extensive expertise, unique perspective and vision for Mississauga. Heritage Mississauga would also like to thank the Ontario Trillium Foundation's Resilient Communities Fund for their financial support to help us bring a sense of place to a wider audience with this webinar series. Join us next week as we welcome Frank Giannoni for his webinar, Port Credit, Back to Life, on Wednesday, September 14, at 12 o'clock p.m. Register now on Eventbrite.